Do you have a paranormal story you want to share on Night Dreams Talk Radio? You could be a guest. Email us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You can advertise your business on Night Dreams Talk Radio and you will be heard worldwide. Why not contact us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You're listening to my friend Gory Anderson on My Dreams Talk Radio, the best in paranormal radio. Well, John, not the best, but not the worst, but we are on the radio. Hey, Hercules, are you still there? I am still here with my coffee. Okay, well, I'm sitting here with tea. I, you know, I can't, I, I'm at the age, I can't drink coffee this time of night. But tea is, well, probably just as bad, I, or maybe, actually, maybe more even healthier. But gypsies, sure, giving a curse. The reason why I asked that is one of my relatives when I was a kid married into, well, gyps- gypsies. And there was a band of them. They would go out, I hate to say it, make picnic tables and do all this stuff and, and, and sell it everywhere. But I remember when I was a little kid, I said something to uh, uh, his wife and she put a, a curse on me. And, you know, and I was like a straight A student at school. And after she put this curse on me, I mean, I was the moron in the class. My my grades went down to like D and E's. And Ooh. and and my whole personality changed for a long time. And every time she would, we'd have family gathering quite often or gatherings quite often. And she would always remind me of this curse and all this stuff. I know it was probably psychological. What's your outtake on gypsy curses? Um, similar to yours, uh, my experience with the curses have been uh, if you allow yourself to believe what the person is uh, saying, that it will take uh, effect on you. So it would be similar to, to being told that you're useless or worthless or stupid or, you know, whatever, uh, that uh, happens to a lot of people in our culture where somebody in their family, uh, somebody uh, who is an authority figure, somebody who is somebody who loves you uh, by definition of the relationship might repeat this over and over and over again until it, it gets into your consciousness and then uh, you fulfill that expectation. And it happens with uh, friends, family, uh, teachers, uh, um, a lot of people throughout uh, life, if you're willing to accept what they say is uh, uh, authoritative, uh, then it can and it often does uh, influence your uh, behavior. Um, I know when I was working in a home attending agency back in the, I guess, uh, um, 1980s, um, there was uh, somebody, uh, she was a home attendant and she was considered to be uh, a uh, witch. So uh, fortunately, I knew a lot of uh, witches, you know, growing up because of my spiritual quest. And most of them were Wiccans, or they were people whose family traditions included the folk magic that uh, uh, a lot of first-generation uh, people had in their families uh, when they were here. Uh, but I wasn't uh, that concerned because I knew that I did not believe that she could do anything to me, even though other home attendants were saying that she put curses on people and people got sick and they had di- they died and, you know, all sorts of things. So what I did was uh, um, I needed to speak with her about a work-related manner. And uh, when she came in, I had, I, I had put on myself eye jewelry, like uh, an eye ring and an eye necklace. And I never said anything about this jewelry, but because I knew that the belief was that curses can be reflected and that you could protect yourself from a curse uh, through like this type of uh, jewelry. And again, I'm Greek and we grew up with the evil eye and all the magical lore associated with the evil eye. And I knew many people in my family that were affected by uh, the evil eye and told stories about it. And also one time I had gone as like in my late teens to Greece and I caught a pneumonia. And uh, back then, the doctors uh, diagnosed me as somebody hadn't put the evil eye on me. So I had to go uh, to this woman uh, dressed in uh, all black, and she would chant, and she was throwing things on a uh, fire with charcoal, and then occasionally something would explode, and uh, it it was very dramatic. And I did feel better afterwards, um, but... uh, 
um, because I didn't believe that this uh, witch could uh, hex me and uh, put a curse on me, although a lot of people seem to believe that in the environment that I was in, uh, it turns out that the eyes I wore uh, broke her uh, confidence because uh, she grew up in a tradition, too, where eyes, uh, like protection from the evil eye, not only reflect the curse, but increase it threefold or ninefold, depending on, again, uh, which uh, uh, beliefs you choose to uh, to keep. Uh, some people, too, believe that uh, if a uh, person associated with the church says prayers, that that will uh, protect you from uh, curses. So uh, a lot of people, uh, they would have like these votive figures of eyes or feet or hands or the heart or whatever was ailing them, uh, and they believed that somebody put a curse on them. They would bring an image of what ailed them to the church, and they would make an appropriate contribution, and they would light uh, uh, the appropriate number of candles and say the pr prayers, and that would protect them or mitigate the effects of whatever curse that they were experiencing. You know, the reason why I, I said that, my, my first wife, uh, I didn't even know she was into witchcraft and the occult, to after we got married, and, and you know, and it, actually it, it, I found out about a week or two later, but I remember coming home and, and having all these strange people and this weird symbol and the candles and even the Ouija board, and it, it, it really scared me because she really believed that she could cast spells and that's what they would do. And it was funny. She was even charging money to right. know, people would come up to her and, and you know, like love potions uh, or hate or making somebody supposedly die. And she would do that. And, and it scared me. But, you know, I remember one time coming home and they had this Ouija board and it was really I saw some really scary things that night. And the next day I knew where she had her, the Ouija board and I went and got rid of it. I actually took it to a thrift store miles and miles away and donated it. And, uh, mm. you know, and then like the next day, I guess, cause she had her evening me uh, meetings. Cause I usually worked late. Uh, I came home and here they are. And I, I said, Oh, you buy a new Ouija board. And they said, no, we traced it down to the thrift store. And I did this kind of like opened my eyes up. I don't know if one of the, the members in her, of her cult just happened to see it in that thrift store or yeah, I don't know. It was just kind of weird, but that marriage didn't last more than two and a half years. And I was happy to get out of it. Oh, I think if you don't know what somebody you are married to or care about is into, and then all of a sudden it sprung on you, uh, unless you, have an understanding of it or, and are open to it, it is going to cause problems. Like a lot of people who uh, get married from different faiths, uh, even though they don't think it'll become an issue, uh, very often, not, although not always, it does become an issue at some point. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I knew somebody in our family, again, that they were Catholic, and and he married a, uh, a lady who was Jewish. And, you know... And they had a couple of children, and that's when all of a sudden the friction started, and then they separated. Yep, it's uh, the human experience, <laughs> and uh, that's why I just spend so much time and energy doing uh, interfaith type of work, so that people have greater understanding of these uh, things, uh, because... Uh, um, you know, uh, love and relationships are work, you know, a lot of times. And uh, uh, if you want to have a good outcome, like with your dreams and, and have a dream relationship, it takes a lot of work and uh, um, a lot of, uh, um, okay, that didn't work out. You know, let me look at it and see if I can change the outcome. You know, and you're not doing it in a dream, although you can practice in the dreams, but you have a reality to, to do that in. And, and that is a form of magic uh, in and of itself, although it doesn't have the, the symbolism and the, uh, um, the props and uh, the, uh, you know, uh, um, the fringe type of beliefs attached to it. It's, it's more like positive uh, uh, mental magic, uh, like the Dale Carnegie kind. Oh, yeah. You put it so well. Now, i got to ask you a question here because our time is running low. Have you ever sure. enc encountered uh, any UFO object or seen one in your life? Yes, I've seen uh, what I would best describe as a UFO uh, a handful of times. 
um, and uh, in my inner states, in my dreams, and in my uh, astral experiences, um, I've encountered many more things that fit, you know, uh, that, that put them, like, right in the middle of the UFO mythology. And uh, lately I've been uh, uh, exploring the Olympian aspects of that, partially through the ancient astronauts, partially through uh, ancient uh, metaphysical uh, writings. But, yeah, it, it is always startling. My first and most dramatic one was I was in Greece as a kid, and I was on a boat uh, going from Athens to Lemnos or from Lemnos to Athens. I don't remember exactly when. It's been very many years. And there was something that looked like a shooting star, and that's what I assumed it was. And then it uh, moved at a 90-degree angle and sped off a lot faster uh, than the, you know, a regular shooting star. And that was the first uh, UFO that I saw. Uh, and most recently, uh, maybe like in this past year, uh, we were driving through Teaneck, and I looked up at the sky, and there was something. Uh, it uh, it looked like a um, one of those um, those uh, fish that uh, are shaped uh, kind of like a shield and have the barbed uh, tail. I'm drawing a blank on what they're called, uh, and uh, they have like a poison uh, barb tail. It looked something like that, but it was more um, angular and almost like pixelated and had a lot of weird protrusions. And I was looking at it, and I didn't know if it was something only I can see that you know was clairvoyant. But then my wife, uh, who's driving, said, what's that? It looks like a UFO. I said, yeah, it, <laughs> it does. You could see it? She goes, yeah, I could see it. So that, that's always very thrilling to me when somebody else can tap into the reality that I find myself in. And uh, we watched it for a good uh, five minutes, I'd say, you know, and then it uh, uh, faded, you know, into the clouds, and we lost sight of it, and we didn't catch sight of it again after that. Now, do you think that they really exist as, you know, humanoids, or do you think they're mechanical? Do you think they're, well, coming from our own uh, solar system from the past or the future? or What's your whole take on it? Um, I personally think all of the above to some degree. Um, I believe that the Olympians, for instance, are real. And uh, I don't uh, believe that because uh, somebody told me to believe it or somebody made a good argument in the book. Uh, through my own experiences uh, with these things, I can come to no other conclusion. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, tomorrow I might have a conversation with someone who helps me see, see things in a, long, in a different way and then I'll, I'll start looking at that, and it might change my belief or not. I don't know. But uh, I view the Olympians as something real, something we don't understand. Uh